Hello and a very good afternoon to one and all. My name is Fauzan Rusli and I'm a research associate with the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore. And on behalf of the Institute, I would like to welcome all of you to the 11th lecture in the ME 101 lecture series. We are thrilled to have Dr. Mark Owen Jones with us, who will be delivering today's lecture titled From Fake News to Fake Journalists, Gulf Disinformation That Fooled the World. In this lecture, Dr. Jones will showcase how comparatively simple deception tricks fooled dozens of newspaper editors in numerous countries into publishing UAE state-aligned propaganda in 2020. From the Washington Times to the South China Morning Post, hoax journalists used fake profiles, biographies, along with AI-generated images to submit op-ads to news outlets around the world. The stories, broadly speaking, aligned with the foreign policy of the blockading states during the Gulf crisis. Dr. Jones will highlight the dangers of social media deception along with the growing export of disinformation from the Middle East to the rest of the world. In doing so, it demonstrates the dangers of growing borderless digital authoritarianism enabled by social media, as well as the ability of Gulf states to adopt new strategies to disseminate propaganda in increasingly sophisticated ways. And now a brief word on Dr. Jones' academic background. Dr. Mark Owen Jones is Assistant Professor of Middle East Studies and Digital Humanities at Hamad bin Khalifa University. He completed his PhD in 2016 at the University of Durham, where he wrote an interdisciplinary thesis on the history of political repression in Bahrain, which won an award from the Association for Gulf and Arabian Peninsula Studies. Prior to joining HBKU, he won a teach at Tubigan Award at Tubinger University's Institute for Political Science and worked as a lecturer in the history of the Gulf and Arabian Peninsula at the University of Exeter's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies. He has edited two books and has an, excuse me, has, and has an upcoming monograph on political repression in Bahrain with Cambridge University Press. In addition to his academic work, he enjoys communicating his research to broader audiences and has written for or appeared on international media outlets such as the Washington Post, CNN, BBC, and Al Jazeera. Before I hand over the floor to Dr. Jones, I would like to remind, to remind our audiences to send in your questions via the Zoom chat box to MEI events. Please do not send them to me or Dr. Jones. The MEI events team will curate your questions and pass them on to me during the Q&A session la later. Without further ado, I invite Dr. Jones to begin his lecture. Dr. Jones, please. Uh, thank you very much, Fauzan, for that introduction. Um, it's very nice to be here, um, virtually, of course, um, but hopefully I'll be in Singapore again at some point soon. Um, it's uh, obviously a pleasure to be here and to, to speak to, to uh, so many people who are interested in the Middle East, uh, particularly the Gulf, which is obviously the area I focus on. Um, my talk today and presentation is going to be, um, I say, slightly different. It's you know, I, I'm trying to experiment a little with these Zoom talks, so I want it to be a more narrative-based event. But I want to walk everyone through an investigation that I did um, about fake news and fake journalists, uh, which is now part of my kind of area of focus. As Fauzan mentioned, I wrote about political repression in Bahrain before, but a subset of my um, work on repression looks at information control. So I'm very interested in how the information space is manipulated by various actors um, and how social media is instrumental in that use. Uh, as many of you know, we live in, or we live in a post-truth or social post-truth age. Uh, and there's this uh, era of um, information wars uh, that basically has, has kind of dominated a lot of headlines for the past five to six years. Uh, we saw particularly under President Trump, the rise of the term fake news. Um, and I think, you know, this, this, uh, zeitgeist is worthy of exploration. And I think one of the interesting things about the kind of general debate that we see is it tends to exclude the Middle East to some degree. A lot of the focus is on the US, China, and Russia, and their role in disinformation operations, whereas there is less focus uh, on countries in the Middle East. This is despite the fact that some of the actors in the region are amongst the worst, or at least the most well-known perpetrators of information operations. So for example, if you look on Twitter's archive of of account takedowns that they believe are linked to uh, state-backed operations. So Twitter publish every now and then accounts that they remove 
uh, on the basis that they believe they're linked to state aligned influence operations. One of the worst offenders uh, behind uh, China, and I think ahead of Russia and Iran, is Saudi, the UAE, and Egypt. Um, so these are amongst the biggest offenders, but generally there gets uh, there's less attention to them. Uh, and I think it's important because we, we see the value that these states place on uh, disinformation and information control. We know, for example, in 2016, that uh, Saudi Arabia attempted to infiltrate the Twitter headquarters. In fact, they did so. They had two agents uh, working inside Twitter uh, and one outside. And now these are the, you know, these are the subject of an FBI investigation and court case that's basically accused these people of spying for a foreign state and sending back classified and personal information of Saudi Twitter users back to the government. So we know that uh, it's normal for, for countries to uh, place a premium on the securitization of the social media space. Um, so today I'm just going to I'm going to start sharing my uh, presentation. Uh, let me do that. Give it a second. I'll make it full screen. Uh, Fauzan, you can see that, okay? Excellent. Thank you. So uh, the thing I want to talk about, which I um, is is how one of these operations might look. Um, and how the Gulf is also not just interested in exporting disinformation, uh, oh, sorry, looking at disinformation for, for domestic audiences, but how disinformation is, a, is a, almost an export. Uh, and, you know, this is linked to the sort of to the Gulf moment in, in the region where countries in the Gulf, particularly the United Arab Emirates, are becoming increasingly assertive in foreign policy. And there's an increasing debate about how the UAE is going to be placing uh, an increased role as the regional policeman, as as this talk of U.S. pulling out of the region. Um, so I think an attendant part of this problem is disinformation. So I'm going to walk you through a kind of fascinating operation that I uncovered along with the journalist from Daily Beast last year. We worked together to 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 look into this exploration and uh, find who might be behind it. And there's also a fascinating connection to Singapore, or two connections to Singapore that I think might be relevant. Um, to 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 uh, everyone attending here. Uh, so, firstly, I just want to give an overview of this. Um, this this is an interesting operation because what we found is that there was a network of fake journalists, journalists who did not exist or who were not purporting who they claimed to be, who uh, were able to publish uh, a significant number of uh, articles and op-eds over ninety in at least forty six different news outlets uh, across the world. Right, so this wasn't just about fo focusing on news outlets in the Middle East, but across the world. Um, and the overarching discourse of these articles was found to be anti-Iran, anti-Turkey, and pro-United Arab Emirates, which leads uh, led us to the conclusion that whoever was doing this was probably some sort of PR agency working on behalf of the United Arab Emirates. Although there is no smoking gun, but as with disinformation operations, there rarely is. Um, but the extent of this is quite interesting. So here is the 19 plus journalists. Uh, we'll talk a bit about this later, but the pictures you see are a combination of stolen photos from social media or AI generated images. So images generated by artificial intelligence. Uh, that's another interesting thing about this operation is its evolution from using basic uh, social engineering te techniques of stealing images to create uh, fake accounts to using now AI to actually create uh, individual unique faces that can then be exploited again for social uh, engineering. Uh, as I mentioned, they wrote 90 plus op-eds in various, uh, in, in some cases, well-respected or well-established uh, news outlets, uh, including the Washington Times, uh, Japan Today, you know, South China Morning Post, Asia Times, New Europe spiked, Newsmax TV. Uh, all of these institutions published then these articles that were written uh, fraudulently by people who did not necessarily exist. So how did this, uh, and here's again, just showing, you know, where some of those uh, news outlets are based, you know, from the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, uh, Jerusalem Post, Japan Today, the National Interest, uh, all over the world. So this was a truly global operation in, in its scale. So how did it start? Well, this is where it gets kind of strange. For those of you who so, use social media and know how bizarre it can be, um, I was contacted by a friend back in May 2020. Um, he said he'd received 
a message from this man you see in front of you, who is called Raphael Badani. Uh, already odd because it's a kind of low resolution photo, but he received a message from this guy. Uh, and this message was essentially, it was fairly direct, but Raphael was asking my friend to, um, he was warning him saying that, you know, that there was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, in this case, the, the, the uh, Yemeni Nobel Prize winner, Tawakal Kaman, was appointed to Facebook's oversight committee. Now, Facebook's oversight committee was established recently to, to allow there to be some form of public participation in adjudicating content takedowns on Facebook. The, the idea being that, you know, who should, you know who, who should have the right to take down content in social media and that needs some sort of democratic oversight. Right. So this person, Raphael, expressed this his fear that Tawakal Kaman, who he accused of being a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, of of um, you know her appointment represented a grave danger to the free world. So it's very melodramatic. And at the same time, there were these other social media campaigns that I was looking at online around the same time that were targeting Tawakal Kaman and her appointment to Facebook. You know, you'd have hashtags trending like "No to Facebook Caliphate," for example. Um, so it was very interesting that this guy had come up with this message. Anyway, my friend told me this ran, he'd been accosted by this guy, Raphael, and he asked what I should do. And I said, well, you know, um, ask him what he wants, because this was obviously kind of dodgy. So, you know, pursue a conversation with him and see what he actually wants you to do. So he said, I would be extremely grateful if you could help me share, retweet relevant content so it can reach your audience, right? So he's trying to use my friend, network to try and expand the reach of his content. So I said, also said to my friend, who was called John for all intents and purposes, um, I was like, well, ask him to Zoom because in these kind of operations, people are very unwilling to, to talk, you know, share their real identity. And I thought, well, if it's a legitimate operation and legitimate concern, this guy should be willing to at least show his face. And then as expected, and I say as expected, I've been doing this for a long time, so I'm very cynical. And I, I smell rats quite easily. Raphael said, uh, I, I, I'd rather not. I prefer to keep my, my time private. And, you know, so, so he, he was acting in a strange way at this point. Um, so I then asked John, well, ask him what he wants you to share, because that might give us another clue as to what exactly he's up to. And so Raphael sent him a link to this article in Asia Times. Um, and he just said it would be great if you could tweet this article, right? Uh, and the, the title of the article was Why Facebook's Oversight Appointment is Dangerous. Um, and it was an article not written by Raphael, but written by someone with a Vietnamese name, Lin Nguyen, um, which was kind of curious. So this, this got myself and, and Adam thinking, okay, so we have a random guy approaching a person he doesn't know on Twitter, asking him to share an article in the Asia Times about the appointment to Apple Commons to the Facebook Oversight Committee. Very odd, um, but you know, Twitter is odd, so it shouldn't always be surprising. So we looked at the article, I looked at the article and, I, and there was a number of interesting things about it. Firstly, the discourse we were seeing against Tawakal Kaman's appointment to the Oversight Committee was, was being pushed at the time by known uh, influencers in the United Arab Emirates and Egypt and to some extent Saudi. So we knew that there was this kind of propaganda drive against Tawakal Kaman which made me kind of think it was an interesting article uh, for Lynn Nguyen to write about. Secondly, I was like, who's Lynn Nguyen? I'd never heard of her. And often, you know, when you've been studying the Middle East or when you work on Middle East politics, you get to know the names and faces of people. And I thought, well, maybe she's just a new journalist. Uh, and then her biography, as you can see here, Lynn Nguyen is an analyst in South Asian regional security, focusing on economic and political developments. You know, Nguyen works on projects advising South Asian government ministries and also private enterprises seeking to do business in the region. It's very generic. There's no mention of any specific qualifications, any specific uh, agency she's worked for uh, or other news organizations. So that generic nature is also a red flag. And so the first thing that's often useful to do in these operations or in, when you suspect something is wrong is to do a reverse image search. Um, so, I did a reverse image search for Lin Nguyen and Asia Times and I didn't find anything. But one of the things then you have to do usually is download the image and flip it along the vertical axis, right? As you see here, right? So it's the same picture, it's just been flipped, which is very simple to do, but this somehow confuses reverse image searches like Yandex or Google. 
So what this led though, it led me to realize that the image used of Lin Nguyen in Asia Times actually belonged to someone called Nu Tai, who'd worked at Fidenham's in Singapore. Now, I believe Fidenham's is some sort of investment company. Anyway, I found a booklet online belonging to Fidenham's and there was a picture of Nu Tai in that. So Nu Tai or Lin Nguyen, same person or same image, but different people, um, which was again, very interesting. So we then did the same with Raphael Badani, the guy who'd approached my friend. Uh, as you can see from his image on the left, uh, Raphael had written for Newsmax Finance. Now, Newsmax is a channel, again, it's sort of a right-wing news organization in the US that's been promoted heavily or was promoted heavily by Donald Trump when he was president. He always talked about, when he was annoyed with Fox News for whatever reason, um, for them not giving enough attention usually, he would promote Newsmax or One American Network. And so he did, um, and this one was a bit trickier because I did, a, a, again, an image search of Rafael Badani that led to this. So you can actually see uh, it's been flipped again. The Rafael Badani Newsmax has been edited, so there's no background. But then that led to the profile of a guy called Barry Dadon, who worked in California. Um, obviously, it's the exact same photo, it's just been flipped. And this involved, again, you know, scrutinizing hundreds of Facebook photos to find the exact image. Uh, but it came up. So something was clearly afoot here. There were these people who were writing articles and clearly using other people's images to, to, to spread their kind of narrative. Um, so what we did then, we decided to look at Barry Day or Raphael Badani's and Lynn Nguyen's track record. Where had they written? Uh, and so we Googled their names and we found out that Raphael Badani in particular had written a lot of articles for this website called the Arab Eye. And the Arab Eye was, uh, you know, a self-proclaimed news site that wanted to give a slightly more, less liberal interpretation of Middle East politics. And as you can remember, you know, one of the accusations against, against the media in the post-truth context has, has been its liberal bias, right? So that's been used a lot. So this Arab Eye website I'd no, not heard of, and the same with Persia Now. Now these two websites were actually uh, not ostensibly linked. There was no official linkage to them, but as you can see, the, the, the graphics are very similar. The color scheme and the branding is almost identical. Uh, so what we did then was decided, let's write a list of all the people who are writing for the Arab Eye and Persia now and apply the same kind of uh, examination and exploration of their, um, um, you know, we'll look at reverse images uh, and that kind of thing about each of the authors. So what we came up with, we came up with a list of um, uh, authors who had written for Arab Eye and Persia now. We looked at... Uh, uh, there to see, to see if they had any social media accounts uh, and to see if they had any like Twitter accounts or LinkedIn accounts. And we just made a, a, a diagram of that. Uh, and what's interesting is that for the most part, the Arab Eye and the Persian Now operation looked like it was trying to be kept separate, right? Despite the fact they looked obvious, the reason we found that they were both linked actually was because we found some uh, Google, um, uh, some Google kind of code that linked the two websites. And in, in one example, there was only one author, as you can see at the bottom here, Amin Farhad Eight, who was linking, who wrote for both of those sites. So generally speaking, there was like a wall between those two sites. Um, and in some cases, uh, Lin Nguyen and also Cindy Chi uh, uh, were focused on East Asia, but they didn't actually write for the Arab Eye and the Persian now, which suggests there might be another operation beyond this focusing on Asia that also exists. Now, another interesting thing was this basically set us up for uh, a lot of work because what you have to do in such cases, you can't just assume that everyone is, is, is fake. In fact, we found one or two people who had written for Arab and Persian now who are real. Uh, and after we released the investigation, we actually got contacted by a number of people who had been approached by the Arab eye, a number of real people to ask them to write. For them. But what we did was we had to determine how many of these people were using stolen photos or other types of photos, or people we couldn't verify independently. So that set up this whole kind of, um, you know, the, the kind of the investigation. So, but we did find like a um, sort of playbook, if you will, a modus operandi. You had, usually what would happen is that you'd look at a journalist, you couldn't find any um, real substantial social media present. You found a Twitter account or a or a LinkedIn account, but that would be sufficiently vague to, to not 
to, to mean that you could not really follow it down many avenues, right? So it was quite rare for them to mention specific institutions or places that work. Um, but in some cases there was, like Salma Mohammed here claims she went to Cardiff University and I went to Cardiff University, so I thought that was interesting. Um, you know, and there was no evidence that she had attended that when we contacted the registry. Um, and in, in another interesting case, again, connected to Singapore, one of the, uh, let me point to here, if you look at the, uh, the second image uh, on the bottom from the left, the sort of black and white one, um, that was Cindy Chi. So Cindy Chi is, um, she claimed to have got a PhD from uh, National Unit of the University of Singapore's Middle East uh, Institute. Um, or I believe, it, or the political science program is one of those, but I contacted the National Unit of Singapore to ask if they had any records of Cindy Chi on file, having completed a PhD, and they eventually said, no, we don't have any records of this person. And what's quite funny is that I contacted Cindy Chi, or whoever ran her account on Twitter, to ask, uh, you know, about her analysis and that kind of thing. And I asked, for example, if she knew Lynn Nguyen. She's like, oh, we move in the same circles, I try and put you in touch. Um, that kind of thing. And we'd have to do a lot of speaking to the editors. So we contact the editors of the Washington Times, South China Morning Post, all these 40 plus organizations to ask what kind of interactions that they'd had with these people who'd written for their websites. So when we contacted, for example, Asia Times about Lin Nguyen, uh, they had only communicated by email. And that was another pattern we found is that all the editors who had published these pieces had only actually contacted or been contacted rather by people via email. There was no verification using video or Zoom, for example. Um, and so that also made us suspicious. And when we contacted Exen uh, South China Morning Post, they said they'd put us in touch with Lin Nguyen uh, and Cindy Chi, uh, and they, they, they never got in touch, right? So there was definitely something suspicious going on. And then in some cases, we were trying to find how many of the photos had been stolen from other people's Facebook profiles or other profiles. We know Lynn Nguyen was stolen. Uh, we know Barry Dadon or Raphael Badani was stolen. Um, but here's an interesting kind of experiment. If you look at the pictures before you, I'll give you like uh, 10 seconds to try and figure out which of those photos is actually real and which of those photos is generated by AI. Here's a really weird spoiler. When I actually do this in class, people always end up believing that the photos generated by AI are the real people and then vice versa, which is kind of fascinating. So I'm just going to press next now so you can see which other photos generated by AI, or at least we suspect they're generated by AI. So the, the, the photos now with AI above them are ones that we could not find uh, any real photos for, and ones that fit the profile of uh, an, a common AI tool used to generate images. Um, and what that means is there are telltale signs, at least now, um, that certain images are generated by artificial intelligence. Now I can see if some of you may see this. Fausen, can you see now that an image on the screen has gone to my browser? Yeah? Uh, no, I can't. I can see your slide. Okay, well, yeah. okay let me just sh change the, uh, uh, the share. Yeah, we can see it now, yeah. Okay, so the image you see in front of you is a, a totally unique person generated by AI. And this is very easy to, to do this. You can go to thispersondoesnotexist.com and it uses uh, generative adversarial networks. It's a, it's a process of essentially machine learning that uh, it's has learned from thousands or millions of real images of people, how to create artificial people. So it's based on real faces. So every time you press refresh, you're seeing a fake image of a person that doesn't exist generated that moment. And this isn't a database, this is unique. So every time you click refresh, you're creating a unique person who doesn't exist. So all these people that you're seeing are not real. Um, the more you look at these, the more you th okay, think there's a sort of profile, but every now and then you'll see, um, you'll, there'll be sort of telltale artifacts in that kind of, in the, that doing there. So I just uh, there'll be telltale artifacts. So, for example, if you look at these two examples, you'll see uh, the ear on the right is is slightly distorted. On the the right hand side, you'll see an obvious glitch. 
which happens every now and accidentally, which looks like sort of a mutation uh, has occurred on a hand or the face. Um, but usually, if you're if you're running some sort of operation, you're going to just keep refreshing the page until you find one that looks kind of legit. But often, if you they don't look carefully enough, so if you zoom in, you can see certain issues with the features. Certain things are hard for AI to, to generate, such as ears. Uh, and what's also interesting is that the the alignment of the face, the eyes, and the mouth is often in the same um, uh, the, the same proportions of the page. So two thirds of the way up, you'll see the eyes, and then one third of the way down, you'll see the mouth, which is funnily enough how you're actually advised to take good portrait photography. So there's a, <laughs> there's an aesthetic component to it, um, which is interesting. So what we did after determining, um, or at least investigating a lot of these authors, was compile a list of all the articles that they'd written. And this was interesting because when you do this, you can look at the content, you can do a content analysis really to see what the, the um, political position of those articles are, or if there is indeed uh, a common narrative. Uh, and this became quite obvious uh, as, as we looked through it. The majority, or I say the majority, a distinct majority of the articles was about Iran and Iran, Iran involvement in the Middle East. So it was very much adopting the right-wing Republican position and the position of, uh, at the time, UAE and Saudi about Iran being a menace to the Middle East. So, um, so you know, like just an example, one of the articles written by someone called Joyce Toledano was called Why Al-Qadmi as the New Prime Minister, uh, with Al-Qadmi as the New Prime Minister, will Iraq's elite still dance to Tehran's tune, right? Um, so, and another one is Iraq deserves to be free from Iranian meddle, meddling. The Iranian regime is killing its own citizens and expressing concerns. Um, as Iraq burns, world leaders stay silent. Has Iran's presence in Iraq marginalized Sunnis, right? So you can kind of get the gist when you're looking at all these articles. And some of them had uh, other aspects. They were anti-Turkey and some, to some extent anti-Qatar. And obviously that nexus within the context of the Gulf crisis where you have UAE, Bahrain, Saudi, and 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 uh, United Arab Emirates blockade in Qatar. You know, this is a very specific foreign policy position, right? Uh, uh, certain entities will be more likely to be those that both oppose the Muslim Brotherhood, Iraq. Uh, sorry, Iran, uh, Turkey, and Qatar. This is a specific narrative that's quite obvious. And the fact that some of the articles were actually praising the United Arab Emirates explicitly also then uh, kind of lent credence to the idea that this operation probably was uh, done or undertaken on behalf of the UAE to some extent. Uh, the interesting, the ones, the ones praising the UAE were written in Asia Times by Lin Nguyen, uh, and they were about the UAE's exemplary resilience to COVID-19. So it was actually, uh, you know, again, praising the, the, how the government responded to COVID-19 uh, at a time where actually it was widely perceived that the government or the UAE was one of the worst countries in, in relation to COVID-19. Um, so it's quite interesting to see that. Uh, there's a few anti-Hezbollah articles. Um, and, you know, depending on the audience, this is quite, what's quite interesting about transnational dis disinformation is depending on the audience, the articles were tailored, right? So a few, one or two articles written for European audiences, for example, in Euro Europe, they focused on the fact they were exploiting anti-immigrant tropes in Europe to try and get their political message across. So they were saying that Turkey's involvement, for example, in Northern Africa and Libya, risked generating more migrants who would cross the Mediterranean into Europe, right? So they were literally using the migrant crisis to kind of, as a, as a stick to beat Turkey with in that context. So it was very interesting to see how lots of these articles were framed according to the editorial position of the, the, the outlet they were aiming for, uh, sort of tailored disinformation. Um, so for example, here, Erdogan's Libya invasion threatens the European Union. Actually, this was written on Al Arabiya, but there was also one in New Europe that was very similar. Uh, but again, this was an English language publication, uh, as were most of them. Um, so again, it was clearly trying to focus on English language audiences in, in global outlets. So the this operation, the first article we found, so the last article we found spanned a year. So the first article was from June 2019 and the last one June 2020. Um, and what's interesting, the earlier articles, again, used uh, stolen Facebook, uh, Facebook photos or social media photos from real people, whereas the articles later on tended to use the AI images, again, showing how disinformation operations will adapt based on the latest technology. 
obviously it's better to have an AI Im image because it's much harder to trace uh, because it's a unique face, right? So this got like more uh, advanced as it progressed, but also it lasted a whole year. So this is a year in which these, uh, this operation had been going on. And just as an example, a lot of these articles written in these outlets were shared by um, mostly uh, people who, who obviously shared or empathized with the political messages. So Ryan Fournier, uh, he was the co-chairman of Trump students, uh, Natalie Gouli, Goulet, for example, a French senator uh, who has been very outspoken on the role of political Islam. Uh, they were all sharing uh, a lot of these articles. Um, and what's very interesting, again, coming back to questions about disinformation, how, how we stop it, is, is the reactions we had from many of <laughs> the, the editors, right? So there was like four responses in, in all the 46 plus outlets that published these, we had about four responses, right? One was to take down the article completely uh, with a note, for example, uh, you know, this article was found to be the subject of investigation. We could not verify the journalist, therefore we took it down. Uh, which to me is an example of good practice, right? You admit your mistake and you sort of say what happened. Um, then there were some of them that just took down the article completely uh, with, without saying anything. So that, that's kind of, I, I don't believe that's good practice because um, although you're removing the information from the sphere, you're not putting an addendum on to say, hey, this was actually uh, believed to have been uh, part of an influence operation. Some just didn't respond and left the article up, obviously. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, bad, bad practice. Uh, but I think there's a worse form of practice, surprisingly, which is leaving the article up with a defense, right? Uh, and those defenses can go kind of either way. It was very interesting. Spiked, which is a UK-based publication, generally considered right-wing, said they left up the article. Um, they'd, they'd adopted it as, no, no, they put up the article. They left it up just as a, just to show people um, to be transparent. So they kind of used that argument. Right. But some of them, um, and this was the, the strangest incident, was for, um, in uh, Human Events, which is a right-wing US publication uh, uh, with a fairly kind of interesting history. Uh, but they acknowledged the investigation and then they said that they had checked with the article and they agreed with the contents of the article. And because they agreed with the contents of the article, they were adopting it as their own, which again is a fascinating thing on the role of ideology and disinformation is is people just um, choosing to believe uh, what they already believe uh, <laughs> because they agree with it. Uh, and so that was quite a bizarre one. And then their editor got really annoyed uh, and told me to get fucked um, because of this investigation. Uh, so they were kind of annoyed that we'd, we'd essentially done their work for them. Um, very strange. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, there was interesting uh, outcomes after the investigation was published. We got this, uh, uh, interesting message from Tom Grundy, who works for, uh, in Hong Kong. And he said they'd been approached by uh, Lin Nguyen and Cindy Chi uh, with pitches for articles. So, um, you know, they, they, they were actually sent these very well written, very polite emails uh, with these ideas for articles. Uh, and this Tom guy said, you know, we, he just, something about it didn't feel right. So he, he said no. Uh, but it's very interesting to see that they, they, they kind of pitched these articles and they were willing, crucially, to do these articles for free, uh, which again suggests that they were probably paid by some other entity to carry out these, these operations. Um, so I'm going to kind of leave it there um, because I just wanted to talk everyone through that operation and, and I'll summarize with a few key points, which I think are, are important. Uh, and they are, you know, it's amazing in this post-truth age that disinformation doesn't actually necessarily have to be that sophisticated, right? Whoever conducted this did so through social engineering, very kind of basic uh, deception techniques that involve on exploiting people's trust in others, right? And I think one of the crucial things about this is interestingly, you see this kind of convergence of the fact that we have a uh, an information deluge. There's so many uh, outlets that publish news in various contexts. There's so much desire for content right? So editors are under a lot of pressure. But crucially, the editors in a lot of these organizations were not doing enough due diligence before publishing these articles. And not that that's necessarily their fault, or it could argue to be their fault, but what are the industry practices for actually verification of, of human beings in a social media age? You know, obviously, a lot of these editors were just relying on communications by email, 
and maybe a quick Google to see if someone had a social media profile as sufficient as a sufficient requirement to determine someone's real. And the more this network operated, the more that they published, the more likely it was that they would be seen as credible because they were having a, a larger resume of these kind of articles. Uh, and I think it's very interesting that we've seen that these, they were targeting English language news sites, but particularly right-wing ones in the US, but global news sites to try and promote a very specific message that related kind of to the, to the, the Gulf crisis, but more specifically to uh, you, Emirati foreign policy. Uh, again, going to show how influence operations from the region are being exported and done so in, in, in ways uh, that are quite uh, are very manipulative. And whilst I say this is a quite a crude operation, it still managed to operate for a year without being detected. Uh, so I think it doesn't matter how crude things are sometimes. Um, as, as humans, we are often easily deceived uh, because we put trust in, in certain markers of trust uh, where they probably don't belong in, an, in a post-truth age. So I'll leave it there, uh, Fauzan, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, or comments or criticism. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, you Dr. Jones. Uh, I think this is one of the best uh, lectures that we've had in this series. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, this goes beyond just uh, academic work. This is also investigative uh, journalism that uh, revolves around the politics of uh, the Gulf states and the Middle East. Mm. Uh, I just have a couple of questions, actually, but uh, I think I'll just start with two. Um, yeah. To, just to follow up with what you have shared with us. Um, uh, firstly, have you, you know, do, do you receive, I mean, you said that this, these operations were undertaken by state actors or probably state aligned actors, right? So um, right. Do, did you receive any sort of threats um, from, from those actors once you, you published um, your research, firstly? And secondly, uh, has this operation stopped or are they getting more elusive um, in terms of how they operate? Um, you know, um, this thing? Mm. Yeah, I mean, really important questions. I think um, the number of threats I receive are uh, the threats. Yeah, I mean, I receive threats, usually uh, ambiguous threats on social media hidden behind anonymous accounts. Um, and so sometimes if I do a piece on disinformation, not necessarily this campaign, um, but this is a good example of one such campaign, I will get uh, a lot of social media attacks afterwards. Um, and a lot of these accounts, you, you, you can't be sure if they're real, if they're trolls, if they're just super patriotic people. Uh, but yeah, occasionally I, I receive death threats in my direct messages. But you, mostly it's just bizarre kind of insults uh, and those kind of things. Um, but I think there's, there's another element to this, which is, which is important, is that, you know, obviously, for example, in the wake of the, the Pegasus scandal, uh, for those who don't know, um, earlier this year, it was revealed that there was a list of about 50,000 people who were potential targets for Pegasus, which is some uh, Israeli-made spyware uh, by NSO group. And this spyware, obviously, it's used to infect your phone. It can record your phone, your WhatsApp conversations, your private calls. It essentially takes over your phone. Is that, um, you know, the my, my, my sort of cybersecurity context have sort of suggested, you know, I get my phone checked regularly because it's important to see that there's no infections. So, you know, it's very potential that you could be a target for this kind of intrusive spyware. And obviously, I know a lot of my colleagues have been targeted, especially those who are journalists. Uh, what's interesting is that in December 2020, we found that the largest cohort of people targeted with this spyware from the UAE and Saudi uh, were Al Jazeera journalists. So they targeted 36 Al Jazeera journalists who were successfully infected. And Al Jazeera was obviously one of the, uh, the, the sticking points of the Gulf crisis. There were demands that it closed down. So it's very interesting to see that. And this is something that I'm, I'm mindful of in terms of threats, because there is evidence to suggest that so in some cases, they, whose, people whose phones have been hacked have had their private information then disseminated again through social media online and used to uh, attack them, defame them, credit them, discredit them, shame them, that kind of thing. So th that's a really kind of, um, it's something you have to be wary about. And in, in regards to the second question, yeah, this is the big, the big, if you know um, adversarial networks or adversarial politics are, it's the cops and robbers idea. It's like they're always trying to outsmart each other to try and create new ways of deceiving others. And I think one of the things, you know, obviously this operation, no one knew about it until we found out about it, right? So you don't necessarily know what's out there until it's discovered. Um, but in my experience, there is lots of, you know, social media networks. I mean, there's common tactics that we see 
uh, at least that we know of now, for example, astroturfing. This is where people create face, fake accounts on social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook, and then they, they create fake groups and pages. So you might have like a, a group of people, a group dedicated to supporting, well, I don't know, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and there'll be like thousands and thousands of followers who don't exist. Uh, that's like a very common tactic. Um, but, you know, it, the interesting thing about that is that we have to actually think who's responsible. You know, I, in my upcoming book on digital authoritarianism, I talk about disinformation supply chains. A lot of the people behind this are well-resourced or well-respected companies based in uh, the US or the UK. So in the case of the Saudi example, it was found that uh, a company called uh, Crosby Texter, who had done work for to get help get Boris Johnson elected, was also the company that was believed to have set up these fake Facebook groups supporting Mohammed bin Salman, right? And we know from other examples and stories that, you know, for example, Bell Potting, a British company, were basically were shut down after decades of work because they were accused of creating fake accounts that essentially almost provoked race rights in South Africa, right? In in the Gulf context, I mean, there's a, you know, there's sometimes we only found out like things due to chance or reporting mechanisms. We know, for example, that there was a, a British company based in Dubai called uh, uh, Project Associates who did work for essentially the parent company of Cambridge Analytica. And they did, had a contract with the UAE Supreme Media Council. And they're specific. They actually filed these documents in the US because technically in the US, an American company, if working for a foreign government, has to register these documents as part of the Foreign Agent Registration Act. And often on these documents, they usually kept very vague. But at the end of this one, there was literally screenshots of some of the work the company had did. And part of these, part of the work they had done was creating adverts, uh, advertising Qatar as a state sponsor of terrorism. So they were literally like, this propaganda is in like official US uh, legal documents, right? And you only find out about that through investigative journalism occasionally because those documents are made public, uh, although it's unclear why. But yes, and as technology advances, as AI advances, it's going to be trickier. I think one of the interesting things we're at the point of is now online trolls, real people who use fake accounts for propaganda or to attack people are more effective um, because they're real people. But as uh, AI um, becomes more advanced, then we've already got to the point where GPT-3, which is this um, uh, AI kind of generated, you know, it, it can create texts and believable texts. And it's even created an article, wrote an article for The Guardian. Once that becomes more sophisticated, then bots will become um, more of a problem again, because the nature of their discourse will be so sophisticated that the, the kind of uh, algorithms that are designed to try and root out fake content are, are, are not going to be able to detect. So yeah, it's, we're getting to that crucial point now, and it's, becoming, it's going to become even more difficult, I think, to find a lot of these fake things with deep fakes, et cetera. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Alex. Uh, he he says here, thank you for your information, uh, sorry, for informative presentation and very detailed examples. What do you think about the role of open source intelligence, OSINT crowdsourcing like Bellingcat in fighting fake news and using OSINT tools open to the public? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a really great question. I think these type of skills, uh, although often, like you said, are called OSINT, uh, open source intelligence, is, is, is a kind of, moniker that we've come to use for what are, is essentially important research techniques. So any researcher will benefit from having uh, exposure to different method methodologies and methods. And I think in an age, a post-truth age, where verifying information becomes so important that these OSINT skills are actually going to be imperative for anyone, not just journalists, but academics and others, uh, because you'll need the resources or it's better to have the resources to be able to verify information especially if you're on the front line of uh curating information and that really is true for journalists and academics uh, so i think people like bellingcat have done a lot of great work especially when it comes to trying to challenge maybe uh, official government narratives about certain situations you know so bellingcat for example very good when that ukrainian plane was shot down by iran you know they were able to kind of Look at that information and sort of very quickly determined that uh, it was probably an Iranian missile that shut it down and you could argue that that pressured then the Iranians to sort of admit that that was the case and there's countless examples where you know those kind of operations are important and um, Bellingcat are just one fact you know facet of all of this you know they're a very organized very kind of well-resourced agency now 
Um, but there's so many people doing OSINT. Uh, there's a lot of bad OSINT out there, so you have to watch that. Uh, and there's also OSINT, is, is a, there's a wide spectrum of skills uh, available. Uh, so for example, network analysis, social media analysis, image analysis, location analysis, all becomes crucial. Um, and it's, I would say it's under-resourced. You know, uh, there's very few people working on it, I would say in the Arabic language context, uh, yet there's a lot of disinformation. You know, I myself spend a lot of time using these things just to try and uh, determine various things. Last year, for example, there was this uh, viral news that there'd been a coup d'etat in Qatar, and it wasn't true. And a lot of the information being used was videos of explosions or military uh, kind of operations that were taken from other contexts. People were doctoring tweets. Um, you know, people were uh, using kind of flight radar information to try and suggest that there was something dodgy going on in the skies. Uh, and, you know, these kind of skills adapt and emerge as well. So I absolutely think they're essential, especially if you're doing work on social media. But I think in any context, anyone can benefit from learning those skills. Thank you for that. Um, so um, we, are, we are still trying to find, um, sorry, we are trying, trying to get some questions again from the audiences. But in the meantime, uh, I think I have another question for you with regards to um, the impact of social media on the Arab Spring. So now 10 years later, we see that um, uh, Twitter, I mean, if you look back 2011, it, it um, you know, just started the Arab Spring because of Twitter. But now we see that it is also becoming increasingly important for us to be uh, to be able to sift through the kind of uh, accounts that, that stir up uh, some kind of news. So I, I'm trying to get uh, your, your a sense of what you think about how um, media accounts in on Twitter, especially, have actually tried to um, stir up certain nationalist sentiments, especially in, in the wake of um, Mohammed bin Salman reforms in, in Saudi Arabia, and how it has also repressed uh, some forms of, um, um, you know, retractors uh, among the Saudi mm. citizens, right? Yeah, I mean, this is goes to the kind of one of the fundamental questions about the role of the internet and social media. It's the dystopian versus utopian binary, right? You know, in 2011, at the, the beginning of 2010, at the beginning of the Arab uprisings, uh, it was the kind of techno liberation utopian paradigm was in ascendancy. People were very convinced by the idea that social media and the internet would bring liberation to oppressed people around the world. It was, it was a very common thought. And it, it even, you know, it made sense. People even, you know, there's pictures of people in Egypt holding up uh, banners with Facebook and Twitter written on them. Um, so there was this kind of optimism. I think techno optimism is, is more appropriate. Um, and then what I would say very quickly, especially in my work on Bahrain, it, it was very clear how regimes adapted to utilize social media as a means of repression. And I think this is a really important debate because, you know, just to give some examples. So while social media can in theory help people organize to connect, to put out, you know, their political cause and the political messages, it can also and has been used as a tool of surveillance. So I've talked a lot about propaganda and fake accounts, but it's also, uh, you know, one of the, the most uh, harmful tactics we saw coming out of 2011 in Bahrain, for example, was that in this period of optimism where people had political change, it was, and, and there was an element of techno naivety. And it's funny reflecting on this 10 years later, people would be very open about what they shared on Facebook. I don't know if Instagram existed, I can't remember that, but certainly Facebook and Twitter. They'd post pictures of themselves, for example, at Bahrain's Pulse roundabout, um, you know, and just because some of them were political, but some of them were just interested in that. And very soon, once the government started to arrest and imprison and torture people, you'd then have these Twitter accounts cropping up and they'd be sharing photos that they'd just been sent by the friends or screenshotted from Facebook of people who were at the Pearl Roundabout saying, oh, this person is a traitor, they need to be arrested. And then this almost became a mini industry. So you'd saw after the space of like a few weeks, one, one account gained like 70,000 followers. And it became like the default person that if someone in society suspected that someone was a traitor or they had evidence, they would send him a photo. He would put that photo out there and ask anyone for their address and phone number. Then he re-put the photo out there with their address and their phone number and saying this person is a traitor. And this was happening on a massive scale, right? And so, you know, and, and as people began to get tortured and, and arrested in real space, 
people's tolerance for engaging in dissent online also changed. You know, you know, you'd have people being sent messages saying, "Be careful what you say online." The state is watching. Or even sometime would someone would just mention the Ministry of the Interior's Twitter handle, uh, saying, "Oh, this person is criticizing the government," and that would be enough to silence them. So you have this kind of dyad, and what what happens in meat space? You know, like a I don't want to say the real world because I think both worlds are equally real. But if you have a government or state that's willing to arrest, torture, imprison, and harm people, then that basically shows the cost of consequences of engaging in dissent. So that reality will inform how people do social media. Uh, and we've seen, especially in countries as large as Saudi and the UAE, once you start arresting people for criti criticism, uh, you know, the death of Jamal Khashoggi is a really important. In the, in the chilling example, you target people who have anonymous accounts. The Saudi case is interesting because they even infiltrated Twitter to try and find personal information about anonymous accounts. Um, you create a chilling effect where everyone becomes more knowledgeable about the state's ability to engage in repression. And that in theory makes people less likely to criticize the state online. So what that means is the space, the online space then becomes a co-opted space that is th that you're limited to in, in demonstrating your political opinions, you can praise the regime, you can be nationalistic, you can talk about sport, you can talk about things that are considered apolitical. So the whole idea then that social media becomes a space for debate and, and free speech is, is kind of moot. And this is why social constructivism is important because technological determinism was the overriding ethos at the beginning of the Arab uprising. Technology will change political systems. The reality is that those political systems will actually inform how people use technology. And that's what's so key because when people talk about the, the emancipatory potential of social media, it's actually it's actually not. So I, I'm kind of, I'm a bit skeptical of those human rights arguments and free speech arguments because the way I see it in an authoritarian regime for the most part, social media will be used primarily as a tool of state surveillance and repression. And it will give voice to those who already support the government's policies. So I, I do think that it is that. And we've seen this change over 10 years uh, and nationalism is in particular a safe way of, of, of demonstrating kind of support, you know. Um, I think I would say like uh, the amount of hashtags that praise the leaders of various Gulf countries are kind of the dominant forms of hashtag here. Uh, it's just a means of, of praising people. Yeah. Uh, speaking of authoritarianism, um, I'm, I'm just thinking whether, you know, uh, state sanctioned um, censorship laws Right. Uh, so, for instance, in Singapore, we have uh, POFMA or, you know, abbreviated mm -hmm. as the fake law, uh, fake news law, sorry. So do you think this kind of censorship uh, actually helps? It's, it's a tricky one. I, 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 like I'm, I'm, I've become somewhat more cynical. Uh, I, I know a bit about Singapore's law and trying to tackle fake news. I know some have accused it of being as it could be used as a tool to clamp down on criticism. I think in the right political context, such laws are important. In Germany, we see uh, you know, Germany have passed laws that basically oblige social media companies to take down uh, high, hateful speech or disinformation. And so far, you know, this hasn't resulted in a collapse of democracy or a collapse of liberal thought. And I think it's implemented very well. So I think there is scope for those things. I think it does depend on the political system. It depends on people's trust in the political system. And it depends uh, crucially on the ability for citizens to have oversight over these procedures, right? If this is just a discretionary process in the hands of the police or private actors with no oversight, then definitely it will be abused. Uh, so the actual me mechanism of, of these th these kind of things is very important. Uh, and so Singapore, I mean, I, I can't remember when the law was passed, uh, and I don't know how much it's been used, um, but I know the concerns in these cases are always that it might be abused early on. Uh, so I guess time will tell. Yeah. Okay, we've received one uh, question from, from the audience here, uh, a question from Sri Kim. Uh, the question is, with the increasing number of worlds we live in, namely one real world and multiple uh, meta worlds being built, there is a possibility that what is fake news in our real world is real news in the fake worlds. How do you think we should handle this? Mm, well, I mean, that's this is an interesting question. I mean, we have a, we have a place of uh, cognitive dissonance. I think when we look at, if we look at the meta worlds being, first, I'm, firstly, I'm not in exactly sure because they could mean different things um but i think we have to be careful of going too post-structuralist about the notion of facts i think when it comes to news and certain things 
we need to respect the fact that some things are evidentiary backed and, and real. And I think that's, that's really crucial. I think the thing about meta worlds is we've seen people tend to believe in anything that supports their existing ideology. So there's this kind of natural confirmation bias in many people where, you know, if there's a political opinion and it's held by someone that that person likes or respects, they will be more likely to believe it, even if it's fundamentally not true. Um, and I think, you know, if you say a meta world is like an echo chamber of news that you receive based on the likes and preferences of your immediate environment, uh, that's that's a possibility of a meta world. And this echo chamber uh, effect or this thought um, uh, bubble effect is actually a real problem. And I, I don't think it negates the value that there's truth and not truth or factually based evidence and not factually based evidence. I think all it does is show that the digital space has facilitated this um, this filter bubble effect where people are exposed or inhabit these worlds uh, where they are inclined to agree with the people they're surrounded by because that's how algorithms work. They promote content to people that they know they'll like and that they reinforce those likes, even if those likes are based on sensationalism and, and fake news. Uh, I think COVID-19 has been a really good example of how we've seen uh, this kind of thing get out of control. Uh, and we know from experiments now, and we know from Facebook whistleblowers that uh, you can sign up to Facebook with a few, uh, you know, bi biographical indicators, and Facebook's algorithms will recommend you like hate groups, uh, fake news groups, very quickly. It doesn't take long for you to be basically exposed to this kind of world of falsehoods, uh, and I think that's dangerous. And there's this potential solutions. This one of them is the regulation of social media companies. You know, they shouldn't incentivize sensationalist news, uh, but also, you know, there's there's things like algorithmic justice loop. You know, when it comes to algorithms, they're often uh, proprietary. You know, there's no public scrutiny of how these algorithms work because in private companies, uh, they're protected. And the fact that we're all using these platforms created by companies generally under the jurisdiction of the US means we as global citizens have less ability to, to kind of intervene in these, uh, these software programs that really are trying to dictate our view of reality. So I do think we need to, rather than just sort of accepting the fate to where we, we, we say, well, let's happily expose ourselves to this falsehoods, is we need to be seeking accountability from those who have the ability to manipulate the information space. Uh, Suikim has also uh, given a, a comment, a remark. Uh, I'm not for these many mm. meta worlds, but I think we cannot avoid them as there are people who wish to find a space for themselves and creating these meta worlds, uh, a way for them to take a break from the real world. Thus, I think these worlds will be like holiday or timeout spaces, but only applicable in the virtual world. Um, uh, and, and with the right laws uh, too, uh, as respectful behaviors need to be universal. So that's just mm. a comment. Do you have anything to, to add on to that? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. I think we shouldn't conflate recreation and, and you know, pleasure and leisure activities in such spaces, whether it's AR, VR, meta worlds with news dissemination. I think they're different platforms and I absolutely agree. We, you know, it's important to find spaces where they have, people have holidays. Uh, I think the danger just comes in when we have influential people uh, posting as true or news things that are inherently false and dangerous to public health. But yeah, I'm all for meta worlds as a place of recreation. Question here from Asif. Um, how do you view the recent practice of established journalists of mainstream media using Indian news reports more and more anonymous sources? How credible are such reports? Is there any established system check on that? Uh, so it's a really good question. And, a, and a, one of the big issues we have, um, I mean, I think even, you know, I would say I thought five years ago, News, newspapers would stop using random Twitter accounts to sort of support particular arguments they have. And I was like, does the person even know who this Twitter account is? It could be anyone. Um, and But the anonymous source thing is something that's happened again through history. Um, and it's not necessarily new, but I do think there is, firstly, I think there's some newspapers are more likely to do it than others. Uh, so I think there is a credibility of the institution at play. Uh, and this is why I think journalistic values are still really important. Uh, because I think most good journalist outlets will will either um, they will have some sort of protocol for dealing with anonymous sources, or they will employ people they believe to be uh, have integrity to to kind of respect the fact that uh, they will use anonymous sources credibility. 
But as you know, I mean, anonymous sources are one of the prime ways of manipulating the information space. I see it all the time saying we have X anonymous source um, saying this, uh, and, and, and then there's no way of verifying who that person is. And at the same time, anonymity is important in protecting whistleblowers. So, you know, it's exploited because there is a good reason for anonymity, just like it's good to have anonymous accounts online because some people need to be anonymous, especially if they live in authoritarian regimes. However, the fact is people do exploit anonymity. It's one of the reasons we have so many trolls and bots on Twitter, because people can set up thousands of anonymous accounts um, with no compulsion to, to verify them and then spread whatever information they want. So anonymity has become this kind of this 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 kind of battle space, I think. But I think as as the presentation I said gave, you see there is clearly a difference in perhaps editorial quality or oversight from news outlets. Uh, and I think, again, this comes back to trust, which is a, is a big problem. A certain news organizations that will have protocols or at least um, the ability to, to, to employ people they believe to be trusted, that's obviously, you can manipulate that. But I think, again, it goes to show that the source matters in terms of the actual news outlet. If it's uh, what seems like an, a, a non-credible source talking about a, an anonymous tip, then I, I, for one, would be like, nope, I don't believe it. Especially the Jerusalem Post talking about using an article based on an anonymous source. You know, I know from my research that there is very likely that that could be a very uh, questionable source done for ideological reasons. So I think in terms of digital literacy, one of the ways to s solve this is, again, people need to be exposed, I think, to to sort of a, it's hard, it's hard to say, like, because, but I think it, people would benefit from actually having training in basic levels of journalism or media studies, right, um, to determine what means to be credible. Because you can't remove this problem, but you can certainly know enough to know that certain institutions are more trustworthy than others. And I think ultimately that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to go back to um, the, um, you know, the media, uh, sorry, um, social media accounts that can be considered as trolls you know, or bots, and then there are also real uh, social media accounts. Um, I think in recent months, we've seen um, the trending hashtags such as uh, Save Sheikh Jarrah in Palestine, for instance, yeah. right? And it was a ground up mm. movement that really gained traction all around the world uh, and actually put some celebrities uh, in hot water as well. I just want to know, um, you know, in, in this kind of situation, right? Um, do you think that, you know, when, when people use social media to garner support all over the world, do you think uh, this could also um, mean that the next sort of Arab Spring or next kind of revolution, mm. wherever that may happen, can, can that be organized again um, by social media, like, like how Arab Spring was organized in 2011? I mean, I think there's, there's, it's possible. I would say, um... You know, social media does play an important role in raising published con public consciousness about specific issues. I think the she Save Sheikh Jarrah thing was interesting because I think there, there is growing consensus that actually, you know, after various intifadas and Israeli attacks on Palestine, that campaign, or at least the cumulative effect of Israel's uh, occupation, was substantial in actually shifting public opinion or exposing people to these to kind of these images. And I think it's particularly true in the US where the US media has generally been uh, more on the side of Israel in this kind of conflict. Uh, and lots of news organizations in the Middle East in particular uh, were, were producing a lot of content that really highlighted the, the brutality of the occupation. And, and so I think there can be um, a huge impact uh, to these things. I don't necessarily think Revolution is 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 the way it will always go. I think revolution or these kind of uprisings are often very much rooted in domestic political politics. Uh, I think that kind of revolution will be different. But I think in terms of a uh, ideological shift over time, I think these campaigns can have an important effect. But there's also counter effects. I mean, the the Palestine case is very interesting. I mean, I'm I'm doing a study now on this uh, campaign that's called in Arabic, Palestine is not our cause, right? So there's also, because as you know, recently in the Gulf, there's been this huge shift with the Abraham Accords, with the UAE, Bahrain, and Sudan, uh, normalizing relations with Israel, and the, 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 the argument that Saudi actually would probably want that, but can't do it politically now, because we're seeing uh, 
there was lots of every time there was like a uh, save Sheikh Sh- Sh- Dara, we saw this hashtag trending Palestine is not our cause and it was basically trying to paint the Palestinians uh, as you know people who exploit Arabs people who are deceptive it was an attempt to try to remove support from the Palestinians by Gulf Arabs right so we're going to see these counter campaigns as well uh, launched on social media I don't think they get as much traction uh, but it's important that we acknowledge them but I do think they're, they're, the recent campaigns were important in raising, raising the, 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 the case of Palestine in people's eyes. And it's partly, I mean, it's partly social media. It just allows people to communicate more. But I think it's these events, uh, and it's, it's also, you know, the fact that everyone has mobile phones, everything is so well documented. Social media allows the transmission of these images and videos, but it's mobile phones and those kind of things that allow those very newsworthy events to be documented. Uh, and I think that's key. We have another question from Alex. Uh, he asks, do you think that younger generations who are digital natives, are they a bit better equipped in spotting fake news and shield themselves from influence operations? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think now of, of, of the students I teach. I think there's a lot of savviness uh, with social media and technology amongst younger generations. Um, that savviness doesn't always translate into good digital hygiene um you know i think there is i i i'm in my experience um knowing about fake news and disinformation also relies a lot of knowledge critical thinking skills that accumulate over time but often specific knowledge about certain regional politics uh, to be fully actualized right so i think that's the problem with fake news it does require technical knowledge uh, or it requires technical experience or that kind of savvy, but you need to, uh, it needs to also happen in conjunction with knowledge of actual world affairs, local politics and accumulated critical thinking skills. So I don't think there's a silver bullet. Uh, I think maybe young generations are an advantage in, in their kind of tech savviness, but it also could theoretically, that it might mean they're more exposed to these kind of messages. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think you can discount critical thinking skills and, and, and knowledge of local politics and stuff that's really key i mean when i think about the when i did the, the presentation i did when i got sent that article by lynn newen about facebook's appointment of tuakul Kaman, because i knew about the campaigns against tuakul Kaman, because i knew that certain countries in the gulf were uh, very much seeking to, to criminalize the muslim brotherhood and when i saw it cited a report by this one think tank that is known to be very right wing that to me, they were signifiers that made me think it was suspicious. So that, that kind of contextual knowledge helped me find that suspicious. If I didn't know anything about the Middle East and I read that article by Lynn Nguyen about Facebook, I might just think, oh, okay, yeah, it's, it's a valid opinion. I, I have no reason to contest that. Thank you. Uh, I just want to go, go back to your presentation. Uh, and this is, a, mm. I think, a minor question. Um, you, you know, you mm. mentioned that some of these uh, pictures were actually stolen from real people, right? So do these yeah. real people, um, you know, know that their photos are being uh, stolen? And do, uh, do they have any legal avenues to, like, sue these people who, who did that to them? Uh, most of the time, they have no idea. So in one, in the case of Barry Daydon for California, um, they had no idea, but we contacted them um, just to ask. And and the Barry, for example, was kind of annoyed when he found out, you know, because I guess he felt violated. Uh, the legal avenues, I'm I'm not sure. I, I think jurisdictionally it would be difficult. There are there are laws prohibiting the dissemination of private information uh, online in some contexts, but most of this information is considered public. Um, but you might be able to form some sort of libel accusation, presumably. Um, if you're saying that someone's using a representation of me to share opinions that I don't have, that reduce my uh, reputation and this X community, oh, I think it would be theft. a long shot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. identity theft. Yeah, and even the identity theft would be would be tricky in terms of fraud. Uh, one of the hard things is that you you rarely know who these organizations are, right? So you'd be like, oh, I'm going to sue this X person, right? And then it's hard to know. Do you subpoena the web server? or a company who owns the web server and which was run to get the identity of the people who are, are they even using their real identity? Do they live in a jurisdiction where it would just be very hard to actually get them to comply? So many avenues. I think there is a possibility, but you'd need like some sort of, you need like 10 lawyers, I think, to 
put their heads together to try and figure out what the best way to do it would be. Um, but that, I mean, there are court cases going on now that involve uh, one of the one, one of the most interesting ones recently is that there is um, an Al Jazeera journalist uh, who believes her phone was hacked with Pegasus spyware. They, she had personal photos of her in a bikini taken from her phone and then circulated online and became this viral Twitter storm where they basically accused her of sleeping with the chairman of Al Jazeera to get promotion. It was a misogynistic kind of abuse campaign, but she is actually taking um, a people, some people who were involved on that hashtag who shared her photos to court, still taking MBZ and MBS to court, will that be thrown out? Um, taking them to court because they, I believe, I think they're using the libel uh, case. But the fact that they used private photos, I think is also part of the legal tactic. But they can only, she can only take that case to the US because some of the defendants are in the US. So again, the jurisdictional issue will, will make a difference on how you try to pursue these cases. This question by Bin Hong, uh, he asks, um, do you think the rise of fake news can be countered by independent citizen journalism like Substack instead of relying on established news website? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, despite what I said earlier, which I, I stand by, I think it's important. Um, you, you have to uh, acknowledge that some of the upcoming uh, organizations are some of the ones doing the most exciting work. I mean, Bellingcat is relatively new. It's not necessarily a news organization, but it's an organization that tries to verify facts about certain events and do so in such a forensic way that it really is about dedication to kind of the truth. Uh, there's a lot of fact-checking organizations that exist in the region, often run by um, very kind of good and diligent people. And I think there is absolutely a space for this. The difficulty is, is, is uh, for any organization, uh, is to try and establish credibility uh, and trust early on. Uh, it can be quite hard. But I think the trick with this is always, you know, the work speaks for itself. If you are an organization mm -hmm. that shows that you can do nonpartisan news or seemingly unpartisan news, uh, and that you clearly have a, a regard for the fidelity of truth and facts through well-sourced and well-researched articles, then you can establish a name for yourself. And I think that's absolutely key. Um, I think a lot of the established news organizations are part of the problem. Um, you know, I would say there's only very few organizations that you could truly trust. And even then it becomes difficult because big organizations become targets for political lobbying or political partisanship. Uh, and that then can also degrade the overall quality of the output. Uh, but the question, the, the difficulty is, uh, Bin Hong, is resources. One of the, the issues we're facing in the journalist world generally um, is, is it's, it's very the financial models of change. The actual number of journalists employed, you know, in non-precarious work is, is decreased uh, and trying to get well-funded um, independent journalism is hard. You know, that's why some better news organizations, perhaps like The Guardian, Democracy Now!, they rely on donations. Um, this is the issue again with the, the privatization of the news industry is that you can then be vulnerable to following the agenda of those who are funding the organization. So I think funding will also matter for anyone setting up a new kind of journal, former journalism or Substack uh, or whatever. Sri Kim has another question here. Um... They say a number of these social media species are made available without cost to users. Do you think more business regulations are needed to ensure owners of these social spaces are well managed by their respective owners? Multilingual spaces are a challenge too. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a really key question. So, I mean, there's the, you know, if you, any of you watch the, the Social Dilemma on Netflix, it's quite an interesting, I mean, it's not complete, but it highlights some really important aspects about the social media business model or the, the business model used by many social media companies and the idea is that if the product is free you are the product <laughs> or the, is, is actually very true so you know the fact that these are free is because our personal information is being sold to advertisers uh, so we're being monetized as subjects and that's why those those platforms are free so i think that in itself is an issue but the issue lies then with uh, privacy regulation and how can we protect our privacy as individuals? How do we have the right to be forgotten? Some of these laws are coming into play in places like the European Union. Uh, we have, you know, there's a recognition that as individuals, we should be able to safeguard the data that is known about us. 
but as it stands, for many of us using Facebook, Twitter, our data is being sold on to other people. Uh, and it's quite, it's quite fascinating when you think about it because, you know, it's, some have argued that this is a form of, 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 of techno imperialism, right? You have these companies based in the US and China to some extent that are providing these free services, monetizing money from consumers, many of whom live outside uh, the US or China, and their information has been modified in, or used rather, and also harms are being caused by those platforms. And this is what's really interesting is that, you know, the idea of techno imperialism lies in the fact that are you providing a, a good service to users or are you exploiting those users for your own benefit with minimum accountability and responsibility? And I think that's where the problem lies with the idea of the developing world. We've seen Facebook basically admit, for example, that their lack of having you know, content moderators who speak specific languages was probably one of the reasons for the acceleration of the, 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 the genocide in, in Myanmar, for example, you know, that they weren't able to successfully curate that content because they didn't have enough people speaking those languages, right? And what does that reflect? It simply shows that, well, Facebook are happy to use those markets, but they're less happy to resource the content moderators needed to make sure that those spaces remain safe. And this is an enduring problem we've seen across the region, and particularly in the Middle East, is how many Arabic speakers do you have moderating content? How many Arabic speakers do you have and no regional politics or local dialects do you have? All right. These things are, I asked, I was in a private meeting with Facebook and Twitter a few weeks ago, and I asked them, and they don't know. Oh, the person who was representing them said, well, I don't know offhand. But that information is also not public. There's no statutory obligation to force these companies, for example, to ensure that their products are well regulated in certain jurisdictions just like the tobacco companies, right? And it's quite amazing because if you think, you know, like Toyota or some car company creates a product with a defect, they recall those products, right? They say, bring them back, it's dangerous. There's no similar regulation in the social media space. Uh, the problem is, is that a lot of this regulation, you know, I think lots of people are relying on Silicon Valley and, and the US to regulate them. And the US famously is not a place that uh, likes regulation. There's a neoliberal ideology of the, of the, the current age that, you know, doesn't like, it rallies against regulation because it believes it's bad for trade. So I think individual countries need to take more, uh, take more of a role in creating their own regulations about how social media is used. But I also think at the end of the day, to stem the problem at source, you need, the US needs to better regulate these companies, uh, better put on them obligations, uh, social responsibility, uh, corporate social responsibility as, as nebulous that is. That means that these companies, uh, respect certain rules and norms. Uh, just as another example, you know, although these are often flouted, you know, most companies or most countries rather, uh, if they sell weapons abroad, they have to try and ensure that those weapons won't, the end user won't be using them to break the law or, or break human rights. The same obligations don't exist for social media, even though those platforms are being used uh, to limit freedom of speech and facilitate state surveillance and propaganda. Um, so I think there can be more done to, to regulate how these companies operate outside their national jurisdiction. But I don't think that's going to happen soon. So I think it's down to countries, whether it's Singapore or European Union or certain things to, to come together and to resist that. And it's, it, I mean, it's hilarious. You, you literally have like a Facebook lobby in Europe now who lobby against privacy regulation. So, you know, it's just like when you talk here about Big Pharma or these other companies, social media has lobbying groups that try to limit privacy regulation because you know, privacy, respecting privacy is bad for business for them, which is kind of fascinating when you think about it. So yeah, it's a good question, Suikim, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a big one. one final question that, that I think I can um, give to you, um, and this is in relation to what you just said about, um, you know, getting uh, governments to regulate um, Facebook, for instance, and I think uh, the Singapore government or many authoritarian states have actually done so. Uh, by by actually uh, bringing uh, Facebook, um, you know, to not to justice, but you know, trying to right. get more information out of how they regulate stuff. But then Facebook is also holding um, their fort and saying, "Look, um, we are not going to restrict free speech." Um, where yeah. you know, in your country, you might deem this as something that's um, that's not acceptable. So, um, I guess with the recent uh, release of reports by former Facebook employees, about how Facebook uh, can can be very 
detrimental to people of certain age groups. How do you think um, uh, the regulation of um, social media is going to, to happen um, at least uh, in, in the different jurisdictions around the world? Uh, do you have um, mm. maybe you know a broad description of how that's going to happen and and yeah 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 what I mean think? Yeah. well I, I think firstly those social media companies exploit the notion of free speech they instrumentalize that as a, as a form of propaganda right so they always act really like their platforms are being utilized for free speech but as I've said how a platform is used depends on the political context of the time if you live in an authoritarian regime, there's more likely that it's going to be co-opted as a space of surveillance and oppression, right? So that argument needs to be kind of shot down because they do exploit it because there's this normative assumption that, oh, everyone loves free speech. Yeah, generally they do. But also most countries also have regulations uh, against inciting violence, hate speech, uh, those kind of things, right? So I, I don't think it's necessarily a stretch that, um, you know, countries could uh, regulate that because they already do. I think the way it works is that often Facebook is, there's a danger of treating Facebook like a publisher, but often in some countries, publishers are liable for the content that they produce, right? So if Facebook was to be made liable or Twitter is to be made liable for the, prob the content they produce, they'd in theory be more pressured into regulating the content that's on their platforms. Uh, that's risky in itself, um, but at the same time, <clears throat> you know, there are laws that do exist and I think they will uh, have to be enforced. And I think Germany is actually a good model because, you know, Germany have, have, have passed this law, they've had some experience in it, and they are able to compel these companies to actually do those things. At the end of the day, like if you want access to our markets, uh, then you actually have to take some responsibility in ensuring that the content on your platforms is safe. Um, so I think that needs to be known. There's a combination of applying existing laws, uh, but also, you know, basically making these companies uh, accountable for the content on their platform, not just saying that we're a conduit for arguments as opposed to a publisher. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Jones, uh, for, for the very enlightening uh, presentation and sharing. Uh, I think we have benefited a lot from you. And uh, uh, I think uh, we, we are going to be more careful about the kind of uh, news that we consume and from which sources we take our news from. So thank you for that. and. Uh, I, I, I think um, oh, I look forward to meeting all of the audiences again next uh, uh, lecture series, right? Thank you so much and have a good night. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.